Tonight's program is co-sponsored with the Chicago Reader and is related to our current exhibition, The Chicago Reader at 50, A Half Century of Revolutionary Storytelling. The exhibit commemorates the independent newspaper's 50th anniversary through a multimedia display of stories, photographs, cartoons, and more. Visit the exhibition at the Newberry free of charge through March 5th. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, we have been free and open to the public and dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us through conversations like this one. Visit newberry.org to learn more about our research opportunities, collections, and exhibitions, our many digital resources, online and on-site classes, and our virtual and in-person public programs. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and the present. Tonight's program is one example of the Newberry's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. During the program, please enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, our speakers will respond. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, if you could all join us for a moment. John Conroy is Senior Investigator at the MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern University School of Law, where he works primarily on wrongful conviction cases. In his former life, he was an investigative reporter and his coverage of the Chicago police torture scandal spanned 22 years. Mark Clements, a survivor of torture at the hands of Chicago police, now serves as an organizer with the Chicago Torture Justice Center, working throughout the United States for criminal justice reform to protect people accused of crimes. Aislinn Pulley is co-executive director of the Chicago Torture Justice Center, founded as a result of the historic 2015 reparations ordinance for survivors of Chicago police torture. She's also a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Chicago and has been a leader in a number of other organizations and publications concerned with social justice. Karen Hawkins, co-publisher and co-editor-in-chief of the Chicago Reader, is an award-winning reporter and editor whose journalism background includes positions with the Associated Press, Windy City Times, and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. She also has served as a longtime mentor and national board member for NLGJA, the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. John, can you please start us off by telling us a little about this chapter of Chicago history? Indeed. Thank you, Karen. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Uh, this is a very truncated history of the Chicago police torture scandal. And what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about one man. But as I do that, I want you to keep in mind that this was a scandal that uh, involved many people. Uh, police officers, prosecutors, judges, politicians, and it was ignored for a long time by the vast majority of Chicagoans, including the media, the clergy, the bar associations, and universities. The man who sort of got this started um, was John Birch. He grew up on the South Side, went to Bowen High School, and when he was there, he was active in the Key Club, collecting cans of food for the poor, and the rifle team and the ROTC. When he graduated from high school, he went to college for about six months, flunked out, and then enlisted in the army. He requested to go to Vietnam and eventually he got his wish. He was a member of the 9th Military Police Company and he was posted to this base at Dong Tham, which was the 9th Infantry Division's headquarters. And one of the duties of a military policeman at this base and other bases was to bring um, suspects like these men here um, in to see the military intelligence people who conducted interrogations. And the MPs uh, sometimes hung around and helped with those interrogations. 
So you can see they work kind of hand in glove. Here's the military police company. Here's the military intelligence. And I would spoken with men who served in this unit, among them uh, the executive officer, a man named Philip Wolliver, who became a police officer in Oregon after the war. And he told me that when he was appointed to the, be the executive officer, he sat in on an interrogation and it involved a field phone. This is a field phone from the Vietnam era. When it's used properly, this crank here, it's a fold out. If I, you fold this out, you attach two wires to these two terminals. And, and when you turn the crank, an electrical charge proceeds down the wires and makes the next phone ring. When you use this as a torture device, wires are run from these two terminals with alligator clips on the end of them, which are attached to someone's body. And when you turn the crank, you deliver an electric shock. And Wolliver told me that after a while, the pain was so great that you could even just fake a crank and the person would go into convulsions. And another interrogator told me that people would literally dance. So Burge was honorably discharged from the army. He applied to join the police. He got a rave review from the detective who did the background investigation, calling him, uh, he assessed Burge as well-built, uh, polite, pleasure to talk to, firm. And Burge rapidly moved up the ranks. Within two years, he was the detective. He's only 24 years old. And he was posted to Area 2, this is the former Area 2 headquarters at 91st and Cottage Grove. To give you an idea of where that is, if you're not from Chicago, um, this up here is downtown Chicago. Whoops, sorry. And down here is where Area 2 headquarters was. This is where Burge lived and grew up, rather, and this is where he went to high school. So zeroing in here, this is where he worked, his home, his school, the difference is that between the time he graduated from high school and the time he became a detective at Area 2, this area had gone from overwhelmingly white to overwhelmingly black. He joined a force that was given to brutality. This is uh, an eight-part series done by the Chicago Tribune in 1973, detailing the brutality used by the patrol division. They never, the Tribune never got up the ranks to detectives. But we know that that same year, Berg started using electric shock to interrogate suspects. The first man we know of whom he used it on was Anthony Holmes. And uh, this was May 29th, 1973. Holmes confessed to a variety of crimes, including murder and Burge got a commendation two years later for his skillful questioning of Holmes. He continued to rise up the ranks, and in 1982, he was acting commander of Area 2 Violent Crimes when two officers were shot dead. Uh, Officer William Fahey and Richard O'Brien, they were shot dead by a man named Andrew Wilson. He was at large for five days. Burge was the first one through the door, when they found out where he was, he was brought back to Area 2, interrogated, and then uh, this is what he looked like when he arrived at Cook County Jail the next day. The bandages you see were put on at Mercy Hospital. I want to call your attention to a couple of things. Uh, note this mark here on his eyebrow and down here on his nose and on his ears. Wilson said, told his public defenders that he had been given electric shock, that he had been wired up to a hand crank device and alligator clips were attached to various parts of his body. And he was at the same time forced up against a hot radiator, which caused these burns. He said on the witness stand later that he could not feel the heat from the radiator, could not feel the burns because the pain in his head was so great. He did confess to the murders of the two officers. And frankly, there's no doubt he did commit those murders. The man he confessed to was the supervisor of felony review. This is the chief of the people who take confessions. He teaches people how to take confessions. But in this case, Larry Hyman 
committed a mortal sin among prosecutors. When you take a confession from a homicide suspect, you always include a voluntariness question, something that indicates that the man who's confessing or woman who's confessing is giving that confession voluntarily. And if you look at Andrew Wilson's confession, it ends with no voluntariness statement at all. It's a unique document. So at the time, Richard Daly was state's attorney. If you wanted to get the death penalty, if you were a prosecutor and you wanted to ask for the death penalty in your case, you had to get his approval. So these prosecutors, I'm certain, must have told him what the case was. The case involved, here's a guy who was all bandaged up as he emerges from Mercy Hospital after he's been arrested. He arrives at Cook County Jail and he has these incriminating marks. And the supervisor of felony review has taken a confession that's unique in the annals of confessions because it has no voluntariness question in it. Nonetheless, they tried Wilson with the confession. They got the death penalty. Wilson won on appeal and he was tried a second time without the confession and he got life in prison the second time. In 1989, Wilson sued Burge in federal court, Burge and other officers who had participated in the torture. And a remarkable thing happened during that trial. Anonymous letters started arriving at the offices of Wilson's attorneys, and you can see the return address is the police department. And these letters identified people who went along with Burge's activities and the ones who didn't. And they also led the Wilson's attorneys to a man named Melvin Jones, who was then in Cook County Jail. Wilson's attorneys were busy. They sent some friends of theirs over to talk to Melvin Jones. And Jones said that when he was interrogated, Burge identified a couple of other people to whom he had also given electric shock, as he did Jones. Jones got it five days before Andrew Wilson. So Jones thereby led those attorneys back to Anthony Holmes, the very man who was tortured in 1973. And by that time, Holmes knew several other people who had been tortured by electric shock and suffocation. And so the attorneys who thought they had one torture victim eventually had eight, and then they had 16, and then they had 32, and, and, and it grew and grew and grew over time. I came in and uh, on, I followed the trial in 1989, did this story in 1990. Afterwards, the Office of Professional Standards, which investigated police misconduct, reopened its investigation. Investigator Francine Sanders concluded that although Wilson was not likable, you couldn't doubt his evidence. The only reasonable explanation for his injuries were that they occurred at the hands of the police under the sanction of Burge and that Burge had repeatedly shocked Wilson and pushed him up against a hot radiator. While she was doing her investigation, a man named Michael Goldston was looking at the big picture. He concluded that abuse was systematic. It included planned torture and the command members were aware of it and perpetuated. So those reports came out in 1990. Three years later, the Chicago Police Board fired Birch. After that, you would have thought something might happen. Uh, there were 10 men who were going on death row who were going to be executed on the basis of suspect confessions, but actually nothing happened for 10 years until this man, Governor George Ryan, pardoned four men who had been tortured on January 9th, 2003, one of his last days in office. And these four men filed civil suits. The first one to file was a man named Madison Hobley. When you file a civil suit, you send some written questions to the man you're suing or the woman you're suing. And Hobley's attorneys asked Burge if he was aware of any Chicago police officer using any form of verbal or physical coercion of suspects. A very broad question. And Burge responded, I'm not aware of any. So a few years passed and then US Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald indicted Burge not for torture, but for perjury and obstruction of justice in a civil suit by lying. Basically, 
Fitzgerald was working with 56 words in those written interrogatories. Remarkably, Burge got convicted in 2010, 20 years after the scandal was exposed, 37 years after he first used electric shock to interrogate a suspect in Area 2. He was sentenced to four and a half years in prison, released in 2015. He died in September of 2018. How many people were tortured by him and detectives under his command? We have no idea. We know there's at least 120. How many people were indicted? Just him. What's the cost of the city in civil litigation on behalf of these uh, torture survivors? More than $120 million. Cost of the city in terms of its reputation. Uh, Peter Neufeld, the co-director of the Innocence Project, says that what Cooperstown is to baseball, Chicago is to false confessions. It is the Hall of Fame. And 60 Minutes calls us the false confession capital of the United States. Uh, if you have any doubt that this occurred, I just want to call your attention to the reparations ordinance wording passed in 2015. The city of Chicago acknowledges that Burge and detectives under his command electrically shocked individuals on their genitals, lips, and ears, suffocated individuals with plastic bags, conducted mock execution, beatings with phone books, and rubber hoses. I'm going to turn this over now to Mark Clements, a terrific activist and uh, survivor who will talk about his own experience and the drive to get the reparations ordinance passed. Thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Mark Clements and I am with Chicago Torture Justice Center. And I am a torture survivor, meaning someone that was taken down to a police station within the city of Chicago and beaten uh, to at least repeat a spoon-fed false confession that kept me incarcerated for over 28 long years of my life. You know, being a juvenile, 16, called a nigger boy, called other racial epithets, and we have a system that calls itself a criminal justice system and for it to ignore the systematic patterns of abuse that had even taken place before Jackie and Andrew Wilson was arrested. It's criminal. It is extremely criminal. It is criminal for the victims of crime. It is criminal for the taxpayers. It is criminal for people to have to suffer at the hands of law enforcement without any accountability being measured out towards the police officers that openly engaged into this pattern of police torture. As I stated, sitting behind a prison wall for 28 years of my life and literally being forced to educate myself which was not bad. It wasn't bad because it began to even open my eyes and to provide me with revelation that I did not know. I first became aware of police torture back in 1992. Being a kid that is now having to face an African-American judge, William Cousins Jr., before now the subject of being sentenced. What I witnessed was other men walking inside of courtrooms, bandaged, no questions ever asked, in most instances, not even by their own attorneys. 
and it allowed for poor African American people to be demonized by a criminal justice system that frankly just did not care. Winning my freedom from prison, I never looked upon the fact that a responsibility would follow. And that responsibility was that there were many other men that remained to linger behind the prison wall. Listening to men that I left behind, people like Antonio Nicholas, who was just freed a week ago, people like James Gibson, and listening to their stories, I begin to ask my own self, who cares? I remember being naive to society, and when I say naive to society, freshly re-entering a society that were individuals that I thought I know, but I didn't know. So I remember sitting down with Roland Martin. I remember sitting down with Kathy Cheney over at the Chicago Defender. And it began to really cause me to wonder what happened to us as a people? How in the world could so many men be victimized by the criminal justice system. Having a little old mother, that's all I had was my little old mother, and watching her fade in her attempts to free me from prison. The anger that comes out of me is something that many people will never, ever understand. You know, torture reparations was a, I would say, a organizing strategy to gain some form of relief, remedy from the city of Chicago, I did not necessarily agree with. And I did not necessarily agree with it due to the fact that it had no teeth to free the other men. In my activism and constant searching, I have been able to discover the fact that at least two females had been taken down to police stations and they had been tortured and there was nothing written in the paper about what took place with them. Losing children inside of police stations as the result of their torture. And it not to have one mention about this it angers me to the core. What type of people, whether we are focusing upon journalists or focusing upon just regular people in our communities, could look at the fact where that women could be taken down to police stations, terrorized by police, and it not raise one eyebrow. Well, in my fight, I grew to learn that many people, many torture survivors, had never been given an opportunity. I was freshly hired out of the prison system with the campaign to end the death penalty. Primarily dealing with death penalty cases and now, uh, the campaign to end the death penalty, fighting hard day and night to save lives. 
I literally re-traumatized myself without even understanding what I was doing as I watched a we had a criminal justice system that could acknowledge the fact that men and women were being tortured, but they were only letting one or two, maybe three per year out of the prison system while the others had to sit in the, it's like a pot and they had to beg for mercy. Reparations to me is, it's great. It's a start, but it represents slave reparations. Let's be clear. However, I do support it because it brings an identity to a systematic problem that existed amongst our Chicago Police Department for decades without anyone being held accountable, what happened to John Burge was still a smack on his wrist. Fighting for torture reparations, however, once I decided to do so, I put my all and in all into it. Because I see my mom's face I remember talking to my moms shortly before she died. And I asked her, what did she want? One was to end the death penalty. Another was to ensure that juveniles would never uh, be sentenced to natural life. And the third was to make sure that John Burge go to prison. So when John Burge was found guilty, it sent shockwaves through me. How dare this criminal justice system, whether they are white, black, green, yellow, orange, they terrorized us to the point of attempting to destroy us. Torture reparations should reflect a start of what is needed so that we can draw healing. We are dealing with complex trauma. Trauma has long graduated from us. And the complex trauma is so mixed where that we are traumatized just by seeing a police car. In closing, torture reparations to me provides a start for people that are literally sitting behind the prison walls who call me day and night and they're begging like little roaches behind prison walls and I stay up all night long researching their particular cases and what I find out is guess what? It is a hidden practice that has went on in this particular city for 50 long years and beyond. For our only African-American female, Michelle Coughton, we as a people, and the reason I shed these tears is because I read her case. I had to stand toe to toe with the torture commission. And how dare you give us bones for justice? It is time that we gain some type of healing. And the only way that healing is going to come is that when these men and women walk out of these prison walls, walk back out into society, that they have opportunity for jobs, housing, and health care. We must keep it right and fair. And that is, we're still this day fighting for justice. Torture reparations was a hard fight by Joey Mobile and the People's Law Office and many different organizations such as the Campaign to End the Death Penalty that many people seem to forget. 
until that year of April of 2011, there were many men that were still on death row, even though death row had been cleared by the governor in 2003. So let's keep it clear and let's tell it right. We have not received justice, but torture reparations is definitely a start. I will pass it over to Aislinn Pooley of the Chicago Torture Justice Center, the co-director. Aislinn. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, so much gratitude and love to you. Um, always and, and thank you for sharing. Thank you for your tears. Um, and thank you for um, always keeping it real. I want to start with a very short video that details the Reparations One campaign. And then I'll talk a little bit about that. I believe in Chicago. I believe in peace. I believe in a brighter future. I believe in myself. I believe in my parents. I believe in education. I believe in life. We can make it. Our needs are basic. Peace and hugs. Wood and love. Blanket. More jobs. More education. Less prison. Less incarceration. More occupation. Less in and around this inside city. This shack town. To all my scholars, that's college down. I see your vision of young and profound. To all my street gangs, it's time to turn back. Let's switch lanes. Get on the right track. It's never too late to reach for the sky. All you need is courage and the will to fly. Gotta have faith when your back gets the wall. We learn how to stand leap up from the fall. I just seen it all. Put the guns down, y'all. Write a new song because it's time to evolve. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That lovely video um, was created before the reparations ordinance passed, obviously, which is why it's called reparations now. 
once it passed, we switched the letters for uh, from now and um, claimed it as a victory, reparations won. Um, and so um, in our celebrations, uh, we, we, we use that um, hashtag as, as a proclamation of reparations won. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the, the ordinance, how we got the ordinance, um, how we passed it and, um, and the organizing work um, that it took to pass it, as well as the work of the Chicago Torture Justice Center. So as, as um, John um, went through very um, thoroughly and eloquently and detailed, uh, you know, Burge's tenure on, on um, the Chicago Police Department um, and carrying out and waging and leading um, uh, multiple um, officers and detectives in, in carrying out torture. Uh, what was also happening during those years, as, as John also talked about and as Mark talked about, was a movement that began to emerge and grow um, in response. Um, that movement is what resulted in uh, Burge finally being fired in 1991, as, as John mentioned. Um, and then immediately after the firing, as, he, as John mentioned, nothing, nothing else was done. And so what happened was that organizers, survivors, attorneys continued mobilizing, continued working um, to, to deepen the, the um, cover up or to uncover, uh, uh, to further uncover um, what had been hidden and to further expose the magnitude um, of, of, of injustice that had happened and was uh, still happening. Um, and finally, in early 2000s, uh, Governor Ryan issued a moratorium on the death penalty after national studies came out and it became um, very clear to the entire country that um, of the um, uh, DNA evidence that resulted in exonerations for, um, for, for uh, dozens of folks. The majority of those folks were from Illinois and of the folks in Illinois, the majority were from Cook County, which is how we got um, the, the moniker as being the false confession capital of the country. Um, and that then allowed for a, a full and complete abolition of the death penalty um, which the Illinois state legislature passed a few years later. However, there were still no charges brought against Burge. Um, there was still nothing other than his firing um, that was of any consequence uh, or any attempt to hold him accountable. And so organizers um, began to issue all types of calls, including a call for reparations, which was issued first by civil rights attorney Stan Willis. Um, and the organization that he founded, which is Black People Against Torture. And he submitted a paper to the United Nations. The United Nations um, Committee Against Torture included it in their findings and, and, and reported and said that something needed to be done. The city of Chicago needed to do something. And then um, uh, once Burge was finally found guilty of obstruction of justice and perjury, um, organizers as and, and survivors, as Mark mentioned, felt like this was a, yet again another slap in the face. And so uh, people got together and formed uh, an exhibit. And the exhibit was wrestling with the question of what could reparations look like? Um, what could justice look like uh, for survivors? How could survivors receive some kind of recompense for, uh, for, for, for the harm that had been committed. And in that uh, exhibition, a call for artists happened, people submitted various types of artwork and Joey Mogul, who Mark mentioned, um, one of the attorneys with the People's Law Office submitted an actual ordinance because that's her, her, her expertise. So she submitted the ordinance and the community said, let's actually make this real, let's make this, um, uh, an, an, an actual thing that we can organize around beyond the confines of this exhibit. And that's what we did. And so we organized and we got signers 
and we introduced it into city council, and then it was sent into the rules committee to die. For three years, it lingered there um, with the full expectation that it was nothing would happen. And then the movement happened. And then um, in May of 2014, CPD tased to death a young man named Dominic, Dominique Franklin. And we formed an organization called We Charge Genocide. And we began meeting monthly to figure out how we wanted to respond to the increasing murders committed by CPD. And in 2014, the Chicago Police Department led the country in the number of killings of Black people. And, and that remained true for about a decade. Um, and so we, we began gathering ourselves and figuring out and wrestling with how can we present this uh, problem um, to, to the wider society and how, and how can we organize? And we sent a delegation to the United Nations charging CPD was torture inspired by the original We Charge Genocide delegation in 1951. And then we decided after we did that, and that was October, 2014, we together with um, uh, Miriam Kaba, Joey Mogul, Alice Kim and countless other organizers and survivors and said, let's wage a targeted campaign in order to get the reparations ordinance out of committee. We are at a unique point in history where there's an uprising happening across the, um, inspired largely by Ferguson, but uh, reverberating across in, in every major metropolitan area. And Rahm Emanuel, um, who was the then mayor of, of, of Chicago, faced a runoff. And this was the first time a Chicago mayor faced a runoff in over 48 years, almost 50 years. So he was particularly politically vulnerable. And we said, let's use this unique historical moment and, and, and organize. And we waged a six month targeted campaign. And so what that video showed was train takeovers, um, town halls, um, uh, different kinds of rallies, marches, um, we did uh, 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 mock um, elections where people could vote to, to support the, the reparations ordinance. Um, we, we created a curriculum and provided it for, uh, for free online for people to hold their own teach burge um, sessions with their family, with their friends in order to expose and, and, and expose the fight um, to, to get the ordinance um, out of committee. And on May 5th, 2015, we were successful and city council unanimously passed the ordinance, thereby making Chicago the first municipality in the country to pass a, a reparations ordinance for survivors of police torture. And part of what makes this reparations ordinance significant um, is that it does a number of very transformative things. It, it includes a very, very small monetary compensation to a very small number of survivors. Um, however, that's, that's not what's transformative about it. What's transformative about it is that it mandated the teaching of torture and, and Chicago police history in all social studies classes and in Chicago public schools, uh, eighth and 10th grade classes. It also provided for the creation of a center located on the South side to treat the psychological effects of torture. And that center is the Chicago Torture Justice Center, thereby creating the country's first center dedicated to domestic torture. And the reason why it's the first is because they, there are federal regulations limiting the 14 other um, torture centers that exist in the country. In addition to that, the ordinance mandated free access to, uh, to all city colleges for survivors, their family members, including their grandchildren. And then lastly, it also accounted for the creation of a public memorial, which has not yet been made. And so we're, we're working with the city to get that made in order to make permanent um, a, a, a city um, uh, created memorial uh, to permanently uh, uh, mark both the fights and the resistance by survivors and the fact that this torture happened and continues to happen. And as Mark said, we know that 
There are many other torture survivors who have not yet been named. There are many torture survivors who remain incarcerated and in prison. And the gender dynamic of who has been, uh, been able to receive publicity um, reveals multiple societal realities with how survivorship is embodied, how survivorship is gendered, um, and how state violence um, is waged and invisibilized against women identified bodies. Um, and so all this to say that the reparations ordinance was a huge victory for, for, for organizing and it is a beginning as Mark said. Um, it does not provide for the release of the remaining incarcerated survivors. That's a fight that we are still waging. Um, it doesn't provide for free access, uh, free health care, um, or free housing. Um, and, and, and those are things that we are still fighting for. Um, but it is an important, an important milestone in, in the history of this work. And it should be seen as um, a part of, 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 of what we need um, all throughout this country. Um, and, and in this moment of, of reckoning that we are in, um, it is a, a concrete example that when we fight, we can win. And I will now pass it over to Karen. Thank you so much, Aislinn. Thank you, Mark, for your testimony. John, thank you so much for that perspective. And I'll just say a little bit about um, my kind of uh, interaction with the, the Burge scandal, and then I will open it up um, to a Q&A with the panel. And then those of you watching, I please encourage you to put questions in the q and I will um, read those after we get through with our discussion. So please do populate that so when we get to there, I will have a lot of questions to ask these folks. So um, I will just say um, that when I was a reporter for the Associated Press, my interaction with the Birch story is that I covered the Birch trial for the Associated Press um, after many years of covering the criminal legal system, both for the AP and for other outlets. And um, I was really passionate about it. And as we were prepping for this, um, Mark asked me to talk about my experience as a Black reporter covering the Birch story. And of course, it has always been deeply personal to me. These uh, men are my family, they're my community, they are who raised me. And it was always really important to me that I tell their stories and that I do what I could do through the power of journalism to help to get them justice and healing. And um, after covering the Birch trial, I of course wanted to keep writing stories because as we keep saying, there were still and are still people incarcerated who were tortured by Burge, tortured by the people he trained, and that were incarcerated based on course confessions, all of the things. And so I wanted to keep writing and to keep working and to keep fighting. And I was basically told to move on. And I had an editor tell me, this was 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, and I will never forget it. Um, my editor said to me, well, yes, Karen, those people are still incarcerated, but some of them are guilty. And to that white male editor, that made it okay for the Chicago police to have tortured them. That meant that we should keep looking, that we should just look away, that Burge had been convicted and that that story, as far as he's concerned, was over. And was, it sent a, a very strong message to me as a mainstream media reporter about the limitations of the mainstream media, both for me as a reporter and for me as a black person and for me as someone who for whom justice and liberation is important, and that um, that's not what that that's not what that's for. That's not mainstream media, in my opinion. That's not what it's for, um, and it's one of the many reasons I am at the Chicago Reader, and I'm so grateful to be here. And um, I I say all of that again to say to to paint a picture for you of of what um, of how the mainstream media has covered this story. And um, fellow panelists, if y'all can. Um, come back on um, and I'd like to have a conversation about the role that the media has played in this story. And John, I guess I'll start with you. You're so humble about your role in this. And I know you, every time I've, I've seen you, I've seen folks talk to you about this and had conversations with you when I was in grad school that um, you, know, you downplay your role in this and the role of your 23 stories about this over the years for the reader and um what role do you think 
your coverage and other media coverage played in this and um, in, in Burge being convicted? Would he, would he even have been arrested without your stories? Oh, Karen, I, I don't know. That's a difficult question. Um, I think that um, Burge got indicted because of a, um, a lot of things in the universe coming together. Um, I think that Patrick Fitzgerald was willing to take on the city. He, unlike other U.S. attorneys, was not so invested in preserving the status quo of the city, he was willing to shake things up quite a bit. Um, and also the attorneys who filed these civil suits um, were just a remarkable group of people who continued to, to fight. I mean, it was like beating their heads against the wall over and over again. And finally they started to prevail. Um, and then, you know, I think the journalism provided a narrative. Um, if you were just coming into this and somebody said, you know, you said, well, I, you know, I'm new to the city. Who's this guy? Um, you could say, well, go and look at this or read that. Um, and you'll figure out what we're talking about. Um, and I think that was useful for new attorneys, new prosecutors. Um, but... As you well know, Karen, it was, um, you know, I started on this in 1989, first story in 1990. Burge got indicted in 2008. So how effective was that journalism? 18 years before, you know, uh, it's hard to say that it was very effective at all. Can I just jump in there? Because yeah. I, I have to say, like, no, it, it, it is extraordinarily effective and continues to be. The House of Screams is, is such a quintessential reading. Um, and, and, and that work, it, it lives on. It, it, its impact it reverberates. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we can look at 18 years. It took 18 years. And it took 18 years and the and part of the reason why we were able to be successful in that way was because of that reporting. It continues, it continues to be powerful. Most of the country has no idea about this. Um, and it's one of the seminal texts that we provide people when, when trying to educate folks on the history. Um, it's extraordinary. Well, thank Just you. Just have to jump in, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you for jumping in because I was going to pose the question to you and to Mark. Mark, do you, how does that land for you? How do you see the role of, of journalism? Well, I think that journalists has been very effective. Those that have taken uh, the darkness of what John Burge did seriously. You know, Anthony Holmes, who is a torture survivor, he often describes you know, being in a dark place, feeling as if he was the only individual who had been tortured until he received a article from John Conroy. You know, we often miss out upon our great legacy. And, you know, I've been out, what, close to 13 years and I've talked to John the key of it is, is that maybe John don't see what he did do as being greatly effective and that it was not just a piece like most journalists has done. It was in depth and it was stories uh, in your writings that allowed for universities like never before. I've been to Berkeley. I've been all in New York, Pennsylvania, Indiana, all over. And everywhere I go, they dig up your article, The House of Screams. So in closing, I can't speak for a lot of people, but I can speak for myself and for Brother Anthony Holmes 
man, what you did was the tip of the iceberg and bringing to light a revelation that the Chicago Police Department, they never, ever wanted to be revealed. So thank you. And let me tell you, if you never, ever do anything for us again, that was what we needed. Thank you. Very kind of you to say, Mark. Um, and I appreciate your sentiments too, Isley. Um, I got to say, when you're in the middle of it um, and you're doing it for so long and nothing changes, um, it's hard to feel that you're having any effect at all. And in fact, um, you know, at one point, one of the editors of the reader told me, um, you know, we've done this over and over and over again, kind of like, and, you know, you can't keep saying the same thing to your readers, you alienate them. And I get that. Um, and, you know, nonetheless, we did continue, but, you know, confidence was flagging that anything would ever change. And I guess it's hard for me to get over that. And I don't want to put you on the spot, John, but I'm going to just for a second to ask what what made you keep going? What made you keep pushing? Aaron, you know, when the when they first told me, you know, the first time I heard that was after House of Screams. And we were so confident that the dailies were going to take over that story because the Trib and the Sun Times were fully staffed. They had great investigators. You know, you could work on a story for six months. They find out, they put two people on it for a week and you're done. Your story's gone. So when they said, you know, John, you know, I don't know that we need any more of these. I got that. Um, because you know, surely the data are going to pick this up. And then when they didn't, um, I kind of tried to find other ways to come at the story. So the second story was about um, the indifference of bystanders, why people who know there's an emergency don't do anything. And uh, then I started, it took me a long time, Karen, for my eyes to open and see that this isn't just the police. And to go up the ladder, you know, prosecutors are involved in this and judges are involved in this and the mayor is involved in this. And so um, what, what kept me going was I kept trying to find a new way to, that I could come in where the editors wouldn't say, hey, we did this one, you know. Uh, and so uh, the other thing was I looked at, for other things to write about. I couldn't find anything as compelling. Um, and, you know, there were guys who were going to die um, if nobody did anything and nobody was doing anything. So it was really hard to give it up. Thank you so much for that. So Mark, I know you mentioned um, talking to Kathy Cheney, um, uh, who's left us, um, <laughs> left journalism. Um, what, what were your, what have your interactions with reporters been like as you tell your story, um, you know, as you do this work? Well, you know, to be honest, we have even voice being upset with John. But the bottom line of it is, is... <sighs> Mark, I want to interrupt you because we couldn't hear you for about a minute. And then you just came in on people were upset with me and I wanted, I wanted to thank you. Well, I would say upset because, well, you know, they had a story and they had been victimized. And there were some faces that was the forefront and there were other faces that were totally left out of the arena. I would say maybe from 1999 to about what, 2004, most of the stories was written upon men that had suffered and they were either on death row or off death row. And I think that, you know, sitting inside of those cells, people don't understand that. You know, it's like 
the only way I can describe it is being a child growing up on the south side of Chicago and we had roaches. So we would take these roaches, throw them in a jar. And every time the roach get to the top, the roach falls back down. And that's the way it is with some of these torture cases. It seems as if the door is going to open, but it don't open. And when it don't open, you got to suck up that disappointment and you got to move forward. Now, being on the other side, you begin, it's called bitterness. It's called, do anybody care? And I'm just keeping it real. It was hurtful until getting out, having an opportunity to meet some of the Medell students, as well as some from Chicago University, and then having the opportunity to travel nationally and to the point of I stop reporters and I ask them why you didn't do this or well from even as I've asked Karen, you know, from a African American standpoint, what was you seeing? You know, in other words, I know that you have an editor and I know that you have a producer behind the scene. Now I know that, but I didn't fully understand. My mindset of journalist was like Superman, meaning someone sitting at a desk, they receive a phone call and they run with the story. Well, come to find out, no, there are so many different layers that you must uh, sell this story to before it is actually put into print. So in closing, relevant to this, and dealing with many of these men and even women cases, people fail to realize the trauma that your body experience. When I say 320 people that I have played a role with being freed out of prison, people listen to it and say 320, that's nothing. Well, guess what? If you just is able to free two people, the stress, the strain, the ups and the downs, man, it wears you out. So, let me tell you, yes, there was some resentment, but there was resentment with a lot of different people who I have had to kind of like man up and go and to apologize to those people for, it's called naive thinking. And when you don't know, guess what? You are going to be mad as hell sitting in that jail cell. Back to you, Karen. <laughs> It's understandable. Well, and I will say, you know, journalists are not good about being transparent about our process. Of course, you think we're Superman. We want you to think we're Superman. We don't want to tell you, well, I got to go back and I got to take this story and I got to get it past all these people, just as you said. So I'm glad that you are aware of the process. I think people don't realize how many gatekeepers there are, and especially in a large newsroom, how many steps there are between you and getting that story to the people who need it. So... I, I'm just glad that you know that now, and I appreciate it. Um, Aislinn, I wanted to ask you, what are journalists getting right now, and what are we not getting right now in covering these stories? That's a great question. Um, I'm thinking of, um, uh, I, I I want to say her name was is Lisette Garza, but I might be wrong with BuzzFeed News, who, who covered the Guevara um, fight. And so if, if, if that's not her name, I apologize, but I, I, I'm trying to remember um, that coverage was extraordinary. I remember when when it when it broke some years, maybe five years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Um, um, I thought I thought that was really extraordinary coverage of uh, Detective Guevara and the families who have been fighting to free their loved ones. And, and Detective Guevara um, has has so far, I think, to date um, uh, has resulted in about 60 
people being um, freed from prison as a result of the forced confessions um, um, that, that he did uh, on, on pre- targeting primarily the Puerto Rican community in Chicago um, and resulted in Kim Fox's and thus the city's largest amount of, of um, exonerations in, in the history. Um, 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 so reporting like that uh, has been just, I think, extraordinarily phenomenal. Um, I, I think that, you know, journalism, like everything in, in media, it, it is shifting so dramatically now. Um, and so the, the big papers no longer hold um, the power to control narrative um, that they once did. Um, and, and that's true of all major media. Um, the democratization that has resulted in just digital access um, in, in, in the internet um, has provided so much, so many more avenues for people to tell story um, and to tell their story or to amplify others. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, citizen journalism um, increase dramatically and, and really kind of speaking to um, the responses of movements, um, and, and which has been really important, especially like during the uprising last year. Um, so I, and, and then we have, um, you know, the reader has, has consistently been um, probably, if, if I'm, I'm trying to think, because now we don't have the defender anymore, right? Um, but has been like the one paper um, where we have been able to tell these stories that all other media outlets or, or most um, have refused to touch. So, you know, even the fact because we have the reparations ordinance, which, which I talked about a little bit, but we also need to defend it. Um, it's not a permanent victory even though it should be, even though it's written as a, as a permanent um, ordinance, um, the city continuously threatens um, defunding of the center saying that they have met the requirements of the reparations ordinance. And there's no deadline, there's no timeline in the ordinance. Um, so that's just patently false. Um, we still are fighting to get the, the memorial built. Um, so we have, we, 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 the fight remains. Um, in order to make sure that the ordinance is fully implemented. Um, and the reader has been the only outlet other than like Truth Out, which is not a printed publication, um, to, to provide real, real amplification. Thank you for that. All right, I'm gonna ask my last question for you, John, and then I'm gonna open it up for the Q&A. So again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and I will ask our wonderful panel. So, John, my question for you, um, what, what advice, what insight do you have for young or even old uh, reporters who are interested in writing these stories, who want to pursue this coverage? I would say there's a lot of stories to choose from. Um, you know, one of the aspects of the Chicago police torture scandal is that Everything has been concentrated on area two and area three, because that's where John Burge worked. But detectives under his command moved to area one and they operated elsewhere in the city. And they learned that you don't actually need to use electric shock or plastic bags to suffocate people. Um, you don't need to hang them by handcuffs. You can just slap them around. You can kick their chair out from under them. You can uh, tell them, look, you can go home if you sign this. And in particularly vulnerable communities, that works. Um, and so you have detectives um, who have run up enormous number of false confessions. Um, and uh, you know, at the MacArthur Justice Center, we see the same names over and over again. Um, you know, the Anglewood Four, four teenagers who were um, convicted of murdering a sex worker by choking her and leaving her body in a dumpster. When the police arrived, the actual perpetrator was standing at the dumpster and they interviewed him. He said he did not know who the woman was. 
Had they run his sheet, they would have seen he'd strangled two women in the previous six months, not to death. And lo and behold, after these guys had done many years in prison, his DNA turns up. You know, their DNA, they all confessed to vaginal sex. And none of their DNA was there. Um, you know, you look at a case like that and you think, you know, surely this is a one-off. These guys can't be that bad. But they are over and over and over again. We've got the same detectives in at least two other cases in our shop. And there's other shops around town that have other cases um, involving these same cops. Uh, so, you know, come to me, uh, come to uh, various attorneys who uh, work on this uh, in the civil rights arena, um, and, and they'll give you a list. Thank you very much for sharing that. All right, I'm going to the Q&A, and I think unless they direct this question to somebody directly, I'll just open it up to, to everyone. Um, so first question, you mentioned organizing for the ordinance for reparations. What exactly comprised organizing for this goal? Um, so I, I mentioned some of what we did and the video covered some of what we did, um, but we, you know, we, we used that those six months, um, which was when between the runoff and, and the next uh, election um, to, to massively organize um, in all throughout the city. And so there were, we, we, we um, collaborated with a number of organizations so that included BYP 100, um, uh, Lifted Voices, um, you know, a, a plethora of other groups, um, and and we held um, uh, we held meetings throughout the city. We we did. I, I mentioned train takeover, and I don't know if people are clear with what that is, but what that means is we, um, along with poets and singers. Um, uh, took over different cars of the subway and would would recite poetry, educating folks on 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 who Burge uh, was on 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 CPD torture, uh, murder and 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 um, killing in the city. Um, and then talk to people one on one, and and we recorded those and, and shared them out so that people could share that online. Um, we created a curriculum, like I mentioned, called Teach Burge, which still is available, so you can Google it and find that and and use it. Um, and encouraged everyday people to hold their own Teach Burge events with either their family or their friends, or maybe you know in a cafe, um, and show show some you know YouTube videos. Um, end of the Nightstick, which was a video that was produced about um, about Burge in, in, in the in the 90s, which was outdated, but had really important um, information there, um, along with other information around, um, uh, you know, more updated facts. Um, and 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 we the, the most important thing that we did, though, is that we engaged the public. Um, we talked to people and we encouraged people to talk to their people. Um, and made it, and you know, and that's the essence of grassroots organizing is that you you talk to to the community, um, and it became a no brainer because of course it is, of course reparations should pass. It's it's the bare minimum. It's not even, you know, it's 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 the tip of the iceberg of of what is due to survivors and 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 family members. Um, um, and so it, it really was, and, 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 and usually in these cases of extreme injustice is that simple. It's a matter of, of just talking to people and sharing the story. Thank you so much. All right, next question. This one's for you, Mark. Um, why do you feel as though women torture survivor stories have not been highlighted to any great degree? You're muted, Mark. If you... Well, I believe that racism still plays a part in this. And I think that, uh, well, it's not thinking, it's knowing that the city of Chicago never wants to open up this true revelation that 
Burge and his subordinates tortured African-American females. All the faces are men. All the faces are individuals that are considered to be tainted sources. You know, it, it really, literally caused my blood to kind of like run when I read these cases and I approach prosecutors just like I approach anyone on the street. I approach some of everyone to try to figure these answers out. And all I can say is racism. And for any journalist that may be watching, I think that it's a good step for it to be told in a fair manner, not only that men were tortured, but men and women were tortured and that our criminal justice system used the death penalty as a tool to try to force many of them into plea bargains. They did force some of them into plea bargains and really just how the monster uh, machine of our criminal justice system actually works. You know, here it is, we have a country that if you scream at a person is considered as domestic. Well, what happens when you pull their hair? What happens when you spit on them? What happens when you punch them? What happens when you degrade them? That's what I wanna see changed. It ain't got anything to do from my lens of black or white. It has everything to do with the integrity. And that's something that we're not supposed to have. People coming out of the prison system, people that have been demonized, we were demonized by the media. I remember talking with Russ Hewing many times <laughs> and to just listen to how NBC and ABC basically treated him as well as Paul Hogan. I knew Paul Hogan as well. How we were treated, that stuff angers me. But racism still plays a part in all of this now today. And I think that the racist aspects of trying to keep it limited to only the fact that men were tortured is why these stories are not being printed. They want to try to make it appear like it's over and tortures have not ended. Thank you. No, thank you. And I would, to piggyback back on that, I would say also, you know, for those of us who are in media and consumers of media to look at the stories you read about crime with a critical eye and look at the shorthand that people use and the language that they use about suspects. I know there's more of an awareness about this now, but I feel like we just take for granted that, oh, of course, they're going to describe someone this way. Or, of course, if you get arrested for something, your photo should run in the paper, right? Like this kind of thing. I, I, I hope that there's more of an awakening about really reading criminal legal system coverage with a critical eye. Um, and Mark, you answered the second part of this question which is for anyone where the vast majority of Burge's victims of black descent. And the second part of that, what has been causing the delay after the 10 year gap after Burge's firing in freeing more of Burge's police torture victims? I don't know if anyone wants to take that. It, it, because they're, they're not interested in freeing folks. They're interested in saying Burge was the only one, he was a bad apple. Um, this is something that happened in the past. He's, he's been fired, he was incarcerated, and now he's dead. It's over. And now let's rebuild police and community relationships. That's, I mean, that's what they want. Um, it, it, the truth is that it's, it, 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 everyone is accountable, um, including all of the prosecutors, the judges, um, and and it, it, it really forces you to take a deeper look at the role of incarceration as a whole in society 
and specifically in Chicago and the role of policing in Chicago and why it exists the way that it exists. It exists for a reason. That type of population control um, is, is a byproduct of, of larger dynamics at play. So we talked about Burge joining the force and was in 1971, can't remember the exact year. Um, John is gonna correct me. I think he that. joined in 60. Nine, sixty-nine uh, became a detective in seventy-two, somewhere around there. Anyway, and 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 this is the time, um, sixty-nine, right? I, I believe it was sixty-nine or sixty-eight when Chairman Fred Hampton and Deputy Mark Clark were assassinated um, it, by a conspiracy between the Chicago Police Department, the FBI, and the state's attorney. Um, and so it's within that context that Burge arose within the ranks, right? It's not out of a historical uh, lineage um, that is playing out right now. Mass incarceration rose at the same time as Burge was being commended for, um, for his, his remarkable confession rates. Um, all of that is linked together. So the, 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 the reason is that pe people have more people haven't been freed is because there isn't an, it, it, the investment is in incarceration right now. In, the societal investment is in incarceration. Um, and, and that's why there's, you know, when we, I, I feel compelled to, to lift up the abolition movement, which calls into question the entire logic of the carceral system which is, which is a, a behemoth. We incarcerate the most people on earth and in history in this country. Burge is not unique. It is unique that we have been able to form a, and forge a movement to uncover Burge, but he is not unique. The reality of mass incarceration should show us that this is not a unique story. Um, and 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 that the tr the tragedies um, of of captivity and the ways in which people are forced into confession, um, we should know is a story that is is too common in this country, and disproportionately targets Black people. And Karen, this is Mark. I want to make one or two little small comments about this. Profit over the people. Back in 1982, when I entered the prison system, they had seven prisons. That's what existed in the state of Illinois. During the tender of Jim Thompson, as well as our great beloved African-American mayor, who, by the way, promoted John Burge to commander and not that John Burge did, I mean, that Harold Washington didn't know. I was proud when I learned how to read and write. Oh my gosh. So I wrote 5101 South High Park, apartment 501. And I knew who Deborah was. The bottom line of it is, is this, we are still in a world in which I don't care what positions we get. We have tendencies to hold back. And when we hold back, it affects entire generational populations. And that is exactly what occurred. And where will it be in our history that it wasn't Yes, it started off with white Caucasian people who took this as forms of racism, but the cover up was also with many African American people. So I'll shut up with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I wish we had more time. I wish I could get to all of these questions. I want to make sure I ask this one. And um, someone said to you, Mark, appreciate your vulnerability and passion. So I think we all do. I want to ask this question. It's from my sister. Thank you, Valerie. 
is the Chicago T Torture Justice Memorial something that you can send an individual donation to? You're nodding yes, Aisla. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not sure if Tracy may have put the links in the chat, but yes, you can certainly donate to both um, the memorial and the center, um, as well as um, it, we have a spokes council that helps implement the curriculum. Um, so certainly, yes, you can donate to the memorial. Wonderful, thank you. And the last thing I'll say, so there's someone in here who has a story that they worked on. Please reach out to the Chicago Reader. Um, you can reach me at Kay Hawkins at Chicago Reader and I can help you land that story somewhere. Thank you panel so much for everything. I will hand it back over to you, Karen. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Karen and John, Mark and Aislin for this uh, really incredibly enlightening look at a dark subject and for telling us about the ongoing work in this area. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. A recording of this program is available on the Newberry's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Newberry programs, exhibitions, and reading rooms remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During these tumultuous times, we need the support of our entire community. Please support the Newberry Library by making a gift today. You can do so online at newberry.org give. Please join us also for our next virtual program on Thursday, February 3rd at 6 p.m. Central an edition of our Conversations at the Newberry series, A Simple Cotton Sack, a conversation about African-American women, trauma and resistance will feature Taya Miles and Megan Sweeney. Join our mailing list to be the first to hear about upcoming programs, exhibitions and other Newberry news. Sign up at newberry.org. Thank you.